Are we all ready? Yes, we're all set and ready to go. Here from the state of Indiana today, I want to emphasize that Marapa has many supporters across America who are here in spirit through they, though they couldn't travel to Washington, D.C. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. No truer words were spoken by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. That's why I am here. Marapa and his family are in my prayers, and I also pray that President Bia will find it in his heart to do the right thing and free Morocco. Sans avancement Which can I come this You like you dick I'm like a gun beep If you know they for club the water You own suffer no good them man This morning we have the verdict of what we have been expecting and waiting for all this long while In this my Kumba in the southwest region of Cameroon we just had a small light rain in the morning some say in Africa, rain is a symptom of blessings. Take it as you like. But what I know is that this morning, hearts were bleeding. Bleeding for one soul called Marafa Hamidou Yaya, who has been um, victimized by a regime satanic as it is in Yaoundé. really willing to get free, y'all sounding like that, y'all can that's, free Marapa, free Marapa, turn it around, turn the sign around, he was wrongly accused, he was wrongly accused, locked up for nothing, locked up for nothing. Marafa Hamidou Yahya was one of the most powerful government officials for the Republic of Cameroon when, in 2012, political rivals had him arrested, tried, and convicted for misappropriation of public funds, charges so unsubstantiated that each year since 2012, the United States has deemed Marafa a political prisoner in its prestigious State Department reports on human rights in Cameroon. In what was supposed to be a confidential cable assessing the political landscape in Cameroon, U.S. officials described Marafa as an astute, progressive leader who aligns with America's interest in curbing Cameroon's rampant corruption and strengthening its commitment to democracy. Within months of WikiLeaks exposing that cable, Marafa was jailed, despite having been rumored for years to be a presidential hopeful. The cable undoubtedly angered people hoping to succeed Cameroon's current aging president, as they likely perceived it as American support for Marafa becoming Cameroon's next president. 
All U.S. support for Marafa since his arrest, no matter its source, has been angrily and quite publicly rebuffed by official and de facto Cameroon government spokespeople. Of late, Cameroon journalists have even specifically condemned the U.S. Friends of Marafa Committee and the U.S.-based Marafa Watch, as well as our U.S. State Department in headline articles. Such rage should be intolerable for Americans who, despite their own economic hardships, pumped millions of dollars into Cameroon only to have much of it stolen by corrupt people densely scattered throughout Cameroon's government and business elite. To add insult to injury, reliable reports indicate that the Obama administration has invited or may invite Cameroon's President Bia to be our country's guest at the U.S. Africa Forum to be held this August in Washington, D.C. While the invitation may be a diplomatic show of good faith, evidence abounds that Bia is an often ruthless dictator masquerading as a democratic leader. Are American taxpayers to pay for Bia to rub shoulders with other heads of state while Marafa rubs shoulders in Cameroon's notoriously overcrowded inhumane prisons? There are many grounds for comparing Marafa to the late great Nelson Mandela, but the respective length of time they languished in prison should not compare. Oh, wow. Here, let me have the hat, Rodney. <laughs> no. <laughs> Your hat. He's look, he's you want me to hold you don't want you don't want to you, you want me to hold no, you right. you just want to hold the sign okay well that's that's, that's all you can do now um you, george do you do you want um right george do you mind holding uh switch with rodney yeah and then um rodney take the little pipe flyers okay there you go Okay, see what this way I, now see what I want to do is I want to film people coming. I'm gonna get over there and I want to film them coming. There you go. Well, anyway, you know, Marafa's chief counsel is uh, Professor Indiva Kofalakali. And I, I know him from law school. We met for the first time at Northwestern in what year was that, 1981. But over the years I, I came to know more about his background, primarily since I've been working as part of Marafa Watch, and came to realize that the professor came to this country against the wishes of his father. He's, he's long deceased now. His father was a, a prime minister for the Republic of Cameroon and he actually wanted Indiva to go to school at the London School of Economics but it was Indiva's choice to come to the United States. So even though he was a, a foreigner in this country and had just left a life of, of privilege. I was amazed as I gradually got to know how much he internalized the struggle for justice of, of black Americans. He actually marched with King and was jailed for a while and suffered abuses that, as my understanding, was quite common to people who were part of the civil rights movement of the 60s. And that motivates a large, that, well it motivates his, his abhorrence, his just intolerance of injustice even to this day. But you know what's so amazing is that I, I didn't know it, I think I was maybe 10 at the time, maybe even younger, but the professor married a woman who lived on a on the corner just one, one a few blocks from, from my house. We, we were one family, prominent family in the na neighborhood and she was part of a prominent family on another corner of the neighborhood. But I never met the professor 
until we went to Northwestern. I think that was in 1981, Northwestern Law School. He had, of course, had graduate degrees before going to law school, where that was my uh, first. I had just graduated from Notre Dame and went to Northwestern for law. Um, and then we graduated from law school in 1984. In 1984, yes. And I, I literally didn't communicate with the professor for nearly 30 years. And you know, you notice I, I, I call him professor occasionally. I will call him in diva, but I'm most comfortable referring to him as professor because, you know, he was an accomplished professor when we when we first met in law school. And here, most of the people we hung around, and myself especially, were just kids not even having our first profession a, a lot of us and he he was teaching and 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 was already a distinguished political scientist so 20 some years nearly 30 years passed and i was at the time a, a full-time good government advocate here in the U u.s but i was beginning to, to focus on the international dimensions of, of, of what we did here in challenging uh, systemic problems with U.S. institutions, government institutions. So I reached out to, to my good friend and, and, and mentor to a, to a substantial extent, Dr. Coppola Kali. Uh, and at some point, he, I was, became aware that he was Chief Defense Counsel for for Marafa Hamidu Yaya, and I I was intrigued because again I was focusing on international human rights issues at the time, and eventually I started working with Dr. Kopalakali in addressing some of Marafa's legal difficulties, which led to me with you and Gail and and my and my husband co-founding Marafa Watch, and a few other people were were in on it. But you know, back to what what inspired the title. I remember as a I was a young child in in the in the late sixties, no more than nine or ten. But I, I even I even at that age I I could perceive through my family, my father, my mother, and things I would hear and see perhaps on on TV. I could I could sense how Black Americans at that time. They had a sense of entitlement to, to human dignity. And I used to marvel at images, and I still do. I, I still do when I see my predecessors, the, the social justice advocates in the 60s. I see them peacefully submit to being viciously attacked by police dogs and pounded by you know, the water from the fire hoses. You've seen that before. You, I mean, you, you recall that, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, pro you know, probably more vividly than I did. And I, and I really contemplate just, you know, how it is that Dr. King managed to inspire people to put themselves in harm's way, uh, considering that the, the justice and the civil rights that are at stake at this time are just as, well, in a large ways, and in many occasions, just as serious. Uh, so often, it's literally life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness at, at stake in a very, very real way. And, you know, this paradox of, of how willing people were, uh, were to even die in the 60s as compared to just how difficult it is to, to, to get people to make, ha you know, to have constructive displays of, of disdain for miscarriages of justice in America. Uh, it's, it's a paradox and, and you know, we're, we're getting ready to do this protest in, in, in Washington, D.C., the protest of the embassy, Cameroon in, embassy in Washington, D.C. and is to commemorate Marafa's arrest in April 2012. We we just cannot let that date pass quietly. It just would be no excuse for it. And of course, it's the first anniversary of Marafa Watch. And you know, I, I I'm just looking forward to seeing how the event turns out because this impatience, 
that in, uh, uh, there's impatience with injustice anywhere that a young Indiva Kofale Kale brought from Cameroon to this country and allowed him to become immersed in the struggle for justice of black Americans. So this impatience with injustice that this country helped nurture in him, Marafa's chief defense counsel. It nurtured it in him as a very young man. I'll, I'll be curious to see if it's still blowing in the wind and if Americans can find it in their hearts to take some time out and in a way return the favor and stand up for the liberty of someone who's very much unlike them in a lot of ways, far, far away, a political prisoner, Marafa, even though we have so many atrocities that we're, we're dealing with every day as, as social, as good government advocates here in the United States. So that's really what the inspiration is. We want to renew this sense that injustice anywhere is intolerable to us as Americans not just here in our country it's intolerable here but it's intolerable no matter where it is because it's a threat to justice everywhere there were a total of 10 individuals who were arrested. More than, more than 10. More than 10. Right. Are, they, are they all in jail? Yes. Okay. What is it that persuades you that Marafa is the person who is, you know, that we, you know, is, the, is, is, the, is really the victim? Are you suggesting that maybe some of the others are guilty? and that Marafa is not? Um, you know, uh, no, that's a very good question. In, you know, in, initially, initially, you know, when the president started this campaign to clean up, uh, I was one of those who applauded him. It was an exercise that you only find done by successor regimes. A government in place doesn't go after its own. And in, in countries where embezzlers have been handled expeditiously, have always been places where the sitting government has been replaced by another government. You find in Nigeria, when the military is removed, the civilians take over and they set up their anti-corruption commission. So I was one of those who said, bring it. But having sat for close to six months and looked at the evidence the state had assembled for the Marafa case, I, I am convinced that uh, we are here witnessing a case of witch hunting. This is what they do. They pick up, they pick up a top-ranking minister who is on record somewhere as saying it would be nice for the old man to take a break and make room for others. So they pick him up and the initial charge would be he, is, he has embezzled 50 billion francs. And over the years, because it takes it usually takes years before they do come to court, finally they say, oh, it's only half a million dollars. Okay? 
is judged and in one, one or two cases is acquitted. I, I, I give you a good one. The former Secretary General, the one who replaced Marathon, was acquitted of all the charges against him. They drive him back to the prison to pick up his belongings. The family was there waiting, drums, you know, we Africans, you know, those drummings are just important. The drums were there, ready to pick him up. I mean, take him home, they had removed his things, put them in the car. He gets there, and the uh, registrar of the prison says, the chief warden says, um, the, <coughs> The chief prosecutor has not signed your release order. Where is the chief prosecutor? He had disappeared. That is, as the judgment was read, he simply disappeared. So the man now, uh, and he said, so what am I supposed to do? He said, oh, I'm sorry, they have to bring your things back. So they brought his things back. Two days later, two days later, he had been acquitted. Two days later, they bring another charge against him. So we have people who, then there's another one who spent his first conviction was 15 years. Two days before the 15 years were up, he was held in court for another series of charges. 25 years in jail. So that's the game. Um, in the case of Marafa specifically, the moment he got into prison, he did what the others had not done. He started revealing things. You know, he, wrote, he sent out letters to the Cameroonian people and said, well, this is what happened. The president was going to I, I call, you know, I go visit the president, as I always do. I, I advise him, Mr. President, don't stand for another seven years. This is 2004. Enjoy this as your last term. Consolidate your achievements so that you can retire peacefully in your own country, as opposed to dying outside your country. The president takes offense. Then, the president says, I hear you are interested in running against me. He said, oh, okay. uh, you know, I'm considering uh, creating the post of vice president. Would you be interested? No. So Marafa did what others have not done. He exposed the underbelly of the system in a series of letters. Uh, you know, in effect, that the, the letters were intended as his own protection. Because, as he said in his first letter, he had no wish to die. So if Cameroonians heard that he was dead, they better look elsewhere for the cause. So yes, I, I think uh, those who are viewed as threats to the regime are the ones who are but they are mixed with others who actually stole one. It is difficult to tell. Be stay home. Be a stay home. Free Morafa. Free Morafa. Be a stay home. Be a stay home. Free Morafa. Free Morafa. Be a stay home.
last summer. I was lucky I checked my email this morning. When did you get word that we're here? About uh, 40 minutes ago when I checked my email. I, I left you a voicemail. It went straight to voicemail, but that had me worried that maybe something was going on. I haven't on. even checked my voicemail yet. Okay, I got it. coverage from Cameroon, I have went to various major media outlets, and there has been a distinct lack of interest in specific stories about Cameroon. I think primarily because people don't see how Cameroon um, intersects with their lives here in America, and because Cameroon has such a very bad um, rating as the most corrupt country in the world for many years. So the, the broad perception is that everyone in Cameroon is corrupt. It makes it very difficult for people who are not corrupt to change the system. So I think it would be good if they had more international coverage, specifically coverage here in America. I'm better known as the whistleblower against Peanut Corp of America, and I'm currently the Green Party candidate for Texas Agriculture Commissioner. What I'd like to speak to you about today is what we call Marafa Watch. Marafa is a political prisoner in Cameroon. If this were any other country that was larger or more military power, the United States would not take this. But for some reason in this situation, we're giving aid to a country who is holding a political prisoner unjustly, and we continue to let it go. As a citizen of this country, this is totally wrong. We wouldn't be pushed around by President Putin, but yet we give money to Cameroon and yet they tell us to mind our own business despite the fact that they're holding political prisoners. This is unacceptable. We need people to be at the Marafa Watch meeting in Washington to be showing our dissatisfaction in how our government and the Cameroon government is handling the entire situation. This is totally not fair and we shouldn't be giving aid to countries who do this. As someone running for agriculture commissioner, I will go so far as to say I'm not comfortable doing trade with a country who reacts like this. And in the agricultural trade, even though I would hate to limit any countries we trade with, are we going to continue our trade and financial aid to a country who carries out such acts as the uh, unjust imprisonment of Marafa in Cameroon? So please get involved. I, as a 
candidate for the Texas Agriculture Commissioner and as a whistleblower fully support this cause and I hope others will join me in doing so. Boy, Andrew, you and Gail really shook things up in Cameroon with your op-eds. You know, Gail complaining about the fact that President Bia issued that decree and only released two of the three high-profile political prisoners, which, of course, didn't include Marafa. And then you turn right around and response, respond to the State Department declaring Marafa a political prisoner for the second year in a row. Uh, it was really some powerful stuff. We've been headline news. I mean, the U.S. Friends of Marafa Committee and Marafa Watch have literally been headline news in, in Cameroon for two, three weeks in a row. Something else. Yes, it's pretty amazing. You know, have you talked to Gail today? I know she's not feeling well, but she was going to be trying to get some relatives, maybe even in D.C., to join us for our protest on the 23rd. No, I haven't, but I'll call her later in the day. Okay, well, I hope things work out. George McDermott, I'm a victim of rights advocate here in Washington, D.C. I'm down here joining in this demonstration today. Free this political prisoner being captive, held captive in his own country, crimes he did not commit without any due process whatsoever. In America, we're supposed to have due process rights, a right to a jury trial. I'm sure he has not had those rights in his country. He was put there by political enemies in the state. And this courageous group here is out today to try to bring attention to this, the plight of this gentleman and all other political prisoners kept in that nation. We are not, he's not alone. We have political prisoners here in this nation also. Uh, even though they don't want to say they're political prisoners, we have them. The International Human Rights Watch demands freedom from all political prisoners and justice for all. I would urge that everyone in this nation investigate what's going on in our nation's courts to prevent this from happening in the very near future in our country. This is George McDermott, I'm here at the Van Metro Station, 22nd day of April 2014. Uh, thank you for inviting me down here to uh, help make a record for you. I don't know if the world changed or simply I changed. Maybe I became more empathetic. Or maybe the internet and 24-7 cable makes it impossible to disconnect from the world outside our immediate lives. All I know is that my sense of justice and injustice has grown. It is still based on who and what I care about primarily, but that circle expands quickly. Through Zena, I connected with Minister Marafa, and now he and his family are like my own. Perhaps that is the only way our world will become better. Perhaps the process begins with who we open our hearts and minds to. Andrew, Dr. Jackson, reminds us that world stability, peace, and development are the cost of idly watching people like Morafa linger in prison. Obviously, that is true, but many people will have to connect with Marafa on a personal level before they will be inclined to join us and push for his freedom. It's so unfortunate that U.S. media has not covered Marafa's story beyond political news and major developments in the criminal case against him. Americans need to hear and see the human interest story of Marafa. He's a husband and father in his early 60s. Marafa is ill. If I'm not mistaken, 
he has a serious heart problem that cannot be treated in prison. His eyesight is deteriorating because of prison conditions and lack of medical care. It is my understanding that Marafa may go blind if he doesn't receive proper medical treatment. It may be easier for Americans to empathize with the struggle for human dignity by groups of people in a foreign country as opposed to the plight of an individual, particularly if that person is not prominent in U.S. media. When we are confronted with injustice and someone we don't know well in a foreign country, I think many conscientious Americans first consider all the injustice we need to tackle at home. I believe that is why it was smart to change our anniversary demonstration for Marafa from a protest to a teach-in in Washington, D.C. There is no doubt that the D.C. delegation of Marafa supporters can rally busloads of people but we're still introducing our networks to the international human rights dimensions of our struggles for justice here in the U.S. They needed to see the core group press forward, even when many of our plans for mobilizing a crowd fell through. The, the D.C. delegation braced a somewhat cold windy day to introduce Marafa to Americans near the Cameroon Embassy in D.C. We even asked Professor Kofala Kali to share his statement in writing and not appear as planned so our demonstration would be distinctly American. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That's what the people heard outside the Van Ness metro stop on an April morning in Washington, D.C. That's what our entire community of grassroots activists heard because on the day before our Marafa Watch demonstration, some of our D.C. delegation called for an increased transparency and democracy at the U.S. Supreme Court. The two days of demonstrations remind us to be vigilant in combating injustice anywhere. Despite our lack of major media coverage, we got the word out and will continue spreading the word that Americans have a stake in what happens to Marafa. We have earned the right to say to the Republic of Cameroon, free Marafa. Hey, I appreciate it. <laughs> Okay. Let them know what you're talking about, sir. <laughs> okay. Let me know you're ready. Ready. Good afternoon. My name is Kwame Jamfi, and I am here supporting the cause for the Morocco Watch Friends of the U.S. And I've done for the United Nations for a couple of years, and I used to work with great people. I support this cause because of my support for human rights as well as rights. I believe that the due process of law is a human right and that any country, any head of state, 
that wants to have a legitimate government has to recognize these fundamental basic rights for all of its citizens. Of Great Britain. A lot of our African countries have struggled with a lot of the basic principles of the democratic process. Therefore, as an international development expert, this has always been one of those issues that have impeded the development of a lot of great nations. Healthcare, education, all of these type of institutions that support the basic quality of life has to thrive in a democratic country. If the democratic process is not working, then that impedes economic as well as social development. So I ask any head of state, particularly the head of state of Cameroon, that in order to legitimize his administration at the bare minimum, please provide a transparent and open due process of law court proceedings that would allow Morafa a, a, a fair trial at a minimum. Thank you, and I'm glad that you invited me here to speak on your behalf. Hi, I'm Mark Lipton, former Deputy Sheriff. The thing that I share with Marafa is corruption and a dirty conviction for something I didn't do. The feeling you get when you're convicted of something, such as these atrocities, is a knot in your stomach that doesn't go away after a good meal. After being a cop for many years, it has given me a new set of eyes that have shown me firsthand how broken this system really is. It also hurts to see people behind these crimes against another person get away with what they have done. It seems the system has much in place for conviction and minor amounts of substance to help uncover such injustices. But then, after many, many cries for help, in comes Zena and her team, and you begin to see light at the end of a long, dark tunnel that empowers me to carry on and fight one more day. So I am sure these feelings are the same as Marafa has each day. Each day, for me, is also filled with prayers, and it's my wish that soon freedom will belong to he and I once again. I know too my Lord will deal with these people someday and they will answer to everything they have done that's caused harm to another human being. Again, I'd like to express my feelings that it's wrong to do these type of things to people, and I hope that uh, our cries for uh, this very distinguished man's uh, freedom uh, gets answered soon. Thank you. On this public demonstration to commemorate Marafa Watch, I want to thank U.S. Friends of Marafa Committee for supporting me over the last 12 months. Please know that while locked up in my prison cell in Yaoundé, it is your letters of support and encouragement that have helped keep me strong. It is impossible to tell you how much this means to me and my family. I am forever indebted to U.S. Friends of Marafa Committee for your tireless efforts in raising awareness for my case in the United States. I can confirm that your postings online and op-ed pieces have been well received by my compatriots, the overwhelming majority of whom believe, as you do, in my innocence. I proclaim my innocence on April 16, 2012, the day I was arrested and charged with complicity in the embezzlement of public funds, and again, on the 21st of September, 2012, 
the day I was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Dear friends, this position has not changed. I am in prison for a crime I did not commit. I am mindful that my predicament is just one of many examples across the African continent where the obsession to hang on to political power by any means necessary has led to a total and careless disregard for the fundamental rights of ordinary citizens and where fear and irrationality have replaced reason and justice. I am aware that my vindication, when it comes, will still leave thousands of other political prisoners languishing in fetid jail cells, not only here in Cameroon, but elsewhere around the world. Please let us not forget that many pending cases still awaiting justice. Let your fight be one dedicated to the eradication of injustice wherever it rears its ugly head. Convey to all my friends my sincere thanks for everything they are doing and continue to do to secure my release from prison. I wish you all the best in your demonstration. From a grateful Marafa Hamidu Yaya, SED Secondary Prison, Yaounde, Cameroon. If you know the fight, keep national. No man go tell you I see ya. Which can I come by this? Mem said you have an opportunity. If you know the fight, pay your guns and tell. Then go bury you side by side. Which can I come by this? For not correct the kehawo. If you know the fight, plan the buffer. You go chica dance your songs and dance your mom. Which can I come by this? You like you chica me like a gumbi. If you know they for club that water, you own suffer no good them man. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, hello, now last time be time Long hair under the top, say the memo 
se produisent les mêmes effets. Dans le lycée, 